Sure. We're now, so the next stage of the uh, day is the Boff of Boffs. We're going to hear from all the Boff organizers who are going to uh, report back on, give, give uh, synopses of all the, all the birds of a feather things that have been so who's uh, managing that, or is that my job? Who's going to be the first person? Uh... It's supposed to be assigned to Francesca. Uh, sure, I can, but... I can do that. But uh, uh, I mean, uh, Stephen, if you want to do it, uh, I was just thinking of going, uh, you know, in, uh, in chronological order, uh, starting from Monday and, uh, uh, and skipping over the people who are, who are not uh, online yet and then uh, fetching them back up uh, later. Uh, but I see, for instance, Jan uh, is online. He was in the many boss and definitely was organizing the, uh, um, the first boss of ADAS 2020. I'll uh, get a little bit higher. Okay. And um, so, so uh, Jan? Who's, who's presenting for, if we're going in order, who's presenting for best licensing practices? That would be yeah, me. I would. Yeah, all right. The guy who was in half the boss. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I'm right. presenting only one, okay? So you'll get, you, you, you won't see mu as much of me as you did for the rest of the boffings. Is this my screen? Yeah. Okay, so well, just to tell you, it's a summary of my boff. I actually uh, presented the same slides in the third boff as well. Um, so just a list of the, the fantastic team that we did it with, I think. Uh, whoops. So the summary, uh, well, I think we were all very surprised by the uh, huge attendance of this of this meeting. More than 120 people interested in this topic is just amazing. Uh, we found out that it's widely accepted. I mean, we found out it's, it's clear that it's widely accepted that that source code licenses are a must, right? You must license your code. Um, the main issue is, indeed, is, also, is not that whether or not to choose a license, but what license to pick. And, and I mean, there is a lot of complex discussion because of external constraints as well and, 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 and things like that. Um, permissive license tend to be more used, of, used than non-permissive ones. I think that one of the things that, that I found out by doing some quick hacking with the data that we got out of the questionnaire is also that even from the people who do not, uh, who decide not to follow the, the policy of their institute, that is in most cases because they want to use a more permissive license than their institute wants them to use. So I, I thought that that sort of says something about their community, I think. Uh, well, relicensing was a huge topic, I think. And there is a clear wish from the community to share these things and learn from each other. I, I didn't even change the typo after Monday, I see, uh, and exchange guidelines. So just to show you the, 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 the nice two graphs from our questionnaire and of course the URL that you all can visit for documentation. Uh, um, so that, that's here, uh, I'll let you parse the data. I think that, that uh, there is certainly a lot of potential for follow-up discussion. So I would probably say, say, say see you next year in some way. Data licensing is an interesting topic. Contributions are an interesting topic. How do we enforce licenses at all? And, and again, the collaboration on a community-based approach is something that I think came out of this, uh, that that is something we should think about in some way. That's it for me. Awesome, fantastic, Jan. Um, the next, uh, the next uh, boss that we have on the schedule was still on Monday. Uh, we have three boss in total on Monday and it's interoperability of users, developers and managers and that was uh, Jan. I think Jan may not be online. Either Jan or me can do it. I have a slide do here. It, Peter. What Jan's status is, he may also have kid duty. I don't know what happened. Is he still there or should I do it? I guess I should do it. Let me share the screen. Yeah. As spotlight, it's a little slow. Yeah, there it is. Share screen one. Put the slide here. I'm going to do it this way because I had problems unsharing. Um, so this was the interoperability between users, developers, and managers, the three uh, stakeholders in what we used to call the gaming table. Long, long time ago, ADAS was using these. I was part of that too, long time ago. The FATS uh, tradition, we had three or four of them. Um, so we had a very lively discussion. We, we, we picked it up last year again, if you may recall, there's a nice write-up of that in the proceedings. 
and we decided to continue that on. Um, as I said, there was a lot of discussion. We now, as Jan likes to say, we have a treasure trove of comments and names. Uh, we did a few polls. This will be summarized in the paper and we will clearly follow up um, with the people that made good comments online because it was quite challenging, as many people have also said, to keep track of the Q&A and the discord and the, the spoken word. So look out for the paper and we clearly have an idea to continue this tradition and try it again next year in Cape Town. Okay, so that's one. I'm gonna slide this out because I happen to be the next one as well. That's right. Yep, there it is. I'm not gonna do full screen because I'm afraid of being not able to unshare. So the third buff, the last buff of Monday was about the topic, how to better describe software for citation and discovery done by myself, by Alice Allen and Bruce Berryman. And for those who know the ASCL, will recognize that all three people are involved in the ASCL, and that was the origin of this discussion. Um, so what do we mean by that? Uh, we wanted to uh, discuss the issue of the uh, metadata for software. Uh, and not many people may know that there is a file that you can put in your software called codemeta.json, also citation.cff and a few others that help you um, promoting your software. In other words, it, it helps you discovering, uh, of course you need a service for that and there are services for that that help you gathering all of these uh, code meta.json's and you can then browse software. And this is not, of course, not limited to astronomy. This is across many fields. Um, Bruce gave an example because there is a service on siteas.org where you can give the URL of your software and it will then tell you uh, how good a person you've been in promoting yourself. Is there a readme file? Do you have this? Do you have that? And so forth. So Bruce described that he was a bit frustrated that uh, the software recognized so little uh, of his software montage. Then Alice gave a, an example how you can use your code if you have re it registered in the ASCL to automatically create a code meta.json and citation CFF. And um, the purpose of that, of course, is that it makes it for you a template. You can then download that as a simple recipe for that, annotate it, for example, put your uh, emails in them and your uh, uh, magic numbers and, and so forth and so on. Uh, and then at some point, all of these files will be gathered and the software will be uh, discoverable. Uh, we gave Jan uh, an invitation to discuss his licensing. So he already gave that summary. Then we discussed, so I'm now at number five, we discussed uh, the metadata. So this code meta.json has a number of items in it, but you can go deeper and, you know, should the, should the API be in there? Should there be even a better description than currently code meta.json describes? The UAT, which is uh, item number six, can also be used. Uh, for example, if you compare a software paper in the AAS versus that of astronomy and computing, you will discover that the ones in the UAT, which the AAS is using, is a little limited in that sense. And that was discussed. Uh, one way to discover better keywords for software is, for example, go to uh, a meeting and do a software census of the people um, that use the software. And there happens to be a meeting coming up about stellar dynamics and stellar populations, and that would be a nice way to get a better census. We summed up by concluding that uh, it would be good to write a white paper about this uh, with uh, common practices and so forth uh, after, of course, that we finish the uh, proceedings. And it was also uh, brought up that we should bring up this topic again in the, at the IVOE, IVOA meeting next week because this has come up before, but it was sort of discarded five or 10 years ago. Whew, that was a longer summary, I think, than I thought, but that was it. Thank you. And I, I will try to stop sharing. If that doesn't work, somebody has to steal it from me. All right. Uh, then we go on Tuesday. Tuesday, we had three boxes as well. The first one was, it works on my laptop, how to approach reproducibility in astronomy. Mateus? Yes, hello. Let me share Hi. the screen. It's gonna be fun. Present. Hopefully that works. 
Yep. Please, okay, just ignore yourselves on the on the on the right hand side. Right. So, thank you very much to everyone who attended this board. I think we had a really really great discussion. There were some really insightful comments. I opened my eyes to to a couple of things and how uh, people can approach reproducibility and what really reproducibility means to different people. So I think, you know, we, we agreed um, that reproducibility is important and essential for, for good science. Uh, and, you know, I, I gave the sort of the, mo the, 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 the very extreme example of, of, of people that I've spoken with in the past that uh, to them, the idea of reproducibility is, you know, having code produce exactly the same results pretty much to a single bit every time they, they run it. And, and I think the consensus was that this is, this is not really what re re reproducibility should mean. That at the end of the day, we, are, we should care about you know, scientific reproducibility. And, and you know, that no matter where we are in, in, this, in, in the chain, what we do, uh, you know, whether we see ourselves as uh, a lot of people describe themselves as, you know, former scientists or, or even sometimes failed scientists or, or former astronomers. You know, we, we have to remember that at the end of the day, no matter what we do, whether we are software engineers, system administrators, what we do is it, it contributes to, to, to scientific results. So, so this is really the ultimate goal, you know, for, for the lack of better word that, you know, we, we are really doing science. So the reproducibility, the, the, the scientific reproducibility is, is, is really the key here. Uh, but, you know, even then the sort of the low level reproducibility uh, is important if it significantly changes the experiment results. But as long as the conclusions that you reach uh, from your experiment, from your software, you know, are, are, are reproducible, uh, then, 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 then we're good. Uh, and, you know, we have to make sure that we enable scientific reproducibility through software reproducibility. There was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, current technologies like containers, uh, Jupyter notebooks. Uh, there were a lot of comments of, you know, how can you care? What, what one that I really enjoyed was how can you care about scientific reproducibility if you sometimes have to spend days just installing the most basic software? Uh, so, so I think this is the sort of the things that, that, that we have to uh, solve and, and have a good way of solving that, consistent way of solving that, uh, in order to really focus on scientific reproducibility. And yeah, we, we need to really recognize the limits, as I said, that, that, that comes back to the, to the sort of the first, the first part of, you know, you have to really define of what you expect from your experiment and, and what you want from your software, from, uh, from your results, and, and, and how would you quantify, what would you really be your threshold for reproducibility? Uh, and then we talked about you know, how we can reach that. And I think there were a lot of comments of, of how we can you know, do it in sort of software way, uh, whether with extra scripts, extra checks, whether we could write extra documentation, some white papers. Uh, but there were a couple of nice comments that, that I think really shows the real issue that is, where, you know, that, that currently we have with reproducibility, that, that we can develop the best tools, the best practice guides, but it really depends on, on, on us to ensure that reproducibility, reproducibility is followed. I can have the best practice guide, the best white paper that tells you what reproducibility is. But if we don't stick to it, then, then, then we're not going to push it forward. It's not going to go anywhere. So we really need to enforce it and, and start enforcing it. And within our, if, within our groups, uh, at, at first you might be unpopular if you create more work for 10 more people. We also need to make sure that the reproducibility is rewarded. So, uh, you know, making sure that it's recognized um, first, maybe through enforcement, uh, through funding bodies that they require uh, reproducible um, One results. One more minute. Yeah. 
and also make sure that you know how we approach to reproduce research so there were a few comments that a lot of papers and a lot of publications and a lot of funding bodies they only look for original research and nobody is really interested in okay let's rerun this experiment let's rerun this situation uh, simulation let's see uh, how it goes whether we can reproduce it and we also just we, there was a quite a long discussion on how peer review approaches reproducibility and and i think the key point from there was that things will have to change in peer review and and how reproducibility especially software reproducibility is approached in, in the peer review process thank you fantastic thank you very much the following one was uh jessica uh the buff formerly known as the fit buff and now called standardizing new and improving old data formats in astronomy. Okay. Is it up? It's up, okay. That's yeah, pretty simple. Um, so it's a, here's the basic um, standardizing new and improving old formats. And um, it's still, we started, we didn't really do this in exactly the order I said because we had problems getting our, our FITS expert on, but um, Lucio Cipetti talked about FITS, um, and Rob and Rob Seaman talked about PDS4. Um, David Shoup talked about Parquet, which I hadn't heard about until he asked me if he could talk about it. And Perry Greenfield filled us in a little bit on ASDF because he knew about it. And then some other several people talked about HDF5. Um, so my general summary is that FITS has been sort of stuck for a while, but we have, everybody has a pretty, there's a consensus about what needs to be done, small changes to make it more useful into the future. Um, the more complicated structured data systems still have formats within them that are compatible with FITS. And if we can make the FITS cover their cases better, then it we require less translation to run a lot of software on, that already exists on the data. So um, one of the things that, despite there not being anything obvious, longer keywords have been, with spaces have been prototyped in C, IDL, and Java already, which means we're keeping up the FIT standard, which is more than most of the other formats have, of being defined well enough to implement in multiple languages. And we just saw Bill talk about why See, FITS IO is the way it is, which is related a lot to by why FITS is the way it is. Um, David Shoup talked about Parquet, Parquet, which is being used at URSA at Caltech for um, catalogs and tables. Um, and it sounds very interesting. And there's a poster on it, which I probably should have, I should have added to this. Um, then PDS4 is being developed in the planetary data system in NASA's centers. Um, uh, for storage and archiving of planetary data, which they will all want to be interoperable and intersearchable, much like we do in astrophysics. Um, a lot of it is astro astronomical data, and some of it is spacecraft data. So they have a lot of different kinds of data, and they're trying to get standards of metadata so it all works, which is challenging. Um, HDF5 has been around for a quite a few years as a structured data format with multiple types in a single structure so that you can move it around easier. Um, but there haven't really gotten to be any standards in HDF5 so that you can create one data set, but it's not gonna be quite like any other. Um, but the good thing is that the software to access it had been pretty closed and now it's more open and it's on GitHub apparently. And then we finished with ASDF, which is being used by JWST and LSST as a data format. And um, it's set up to meet their standards and they talk. It's being semi-independently developed by the two big projects, but they talk sometimes. Um, but I'm not sure, we didn't actually talk about how much they're talking these days. That was an issue at the last couple of um, data formats, Bob, of getting those two groups to agree on standards for metadata as well as for the formats. And so that's where we are going to the future. I think there are gonna be some changes in FITS in the next year or two. Um, there's some big interesting formats coming up, which we'll see more data in. 
And I think they'll be well enough defined that we can translate data between formats, which is important too. And that's pretty much it. The whole presentation is um, this brief one and then the entire, all the view graphs are gonna be available through the website, through the ADAS. Fantastic. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we had the last um, buff of Tuesday was provenance, practical provenance in astronomy. I don't know if we have people here who want to present it. Okay, we have somebody with their hands up, Francois. I can I can move you. Uh, well, I can uh, uh, I will promote you to a panelist. We have Bruce. Sorry, Wasn't Bruce. Oh, maybe I'm confused. No, no, it was the the Providence people would like to talk last, please. Yes, I want to ah. speak last because we were not aware of preparing the slides, so I'm just finishing them. Perfect, so, Francois, no problem. If you don't uh, mind, yep. I will speak the last one. That's perfect. Then we had uh, a standardization of data formats in gamma ray astronomy, that was uh, COSIMO uh, and the Tarek. Uh, I don't see them online. We can skip. Um, then there was a Radio Archives Roundtable. Katrina, you are online here, right? Yes, I'm here. Just give me a second to share sure. my summary slide. Let's see, here we go. So, yes, we had a very lively discussion as well. Um, very interesting things. Um, yeah, we, we started by querying a bit the archives around the world. Um, what kind of data they're serving, well, the archives of the big radio observatories, what kind of data they're surveying and how they do this. And they they told us that many still serve like the raw visibilities, but there's definitely a move towards calibrated visibilities and even science ready image data, um, which is, this move is partly driven by the fact that raw visibilities usually take up lots and lots of space. Um, and many of the archives have some type of VO protocols implemented, which is pretty cool because it makes it very easy to query these archives. Um, and two questions that came up in this um, uh, topic of querying these archives are, how can we bring, or how can we write quality measures in the in the tables to query the data that is there? Like. Um, is there a lot of interference with other sources so that there might be a lot of flagging necessary in the data reduction process or what's the PSF going to be like? And these, these things are very hard to predict because they depend on the, on the data reduction process. So um, yeah, there's a bit of a discussion ongoing how we can give, a, give an estimate of these um, in a way so that the astronomers have a feeling for what kind of data they're going to get. And the other thing is that visibilities are, um, well, to, to some degree a bit abstract, they're not yet a finalized image. So it's hard to, to search them and it's, it's hard to make them like a, well, I've written useful, but that's more in inverted commas. Um, I guess the thing is, for example, Alma just gives the visibilities as auxiliary data because um, it's hard to query them by themselves in a good way, which which is also connected to the question how we can properly describe the quality of these these data. And so that that was one point. And the other point is, given that there's still only lots of raw data available and not always. Um, reduce the calibrated data, it would be really cool if small surveys who, well, small projects could just upload that data somewhere though, so that it was available for others, the reduced and science-ready data. And so this is, this is, I think, a great idea. And yeah. And then we moved on to a bit of a longer discussions, which is again about data formats and probably would have been 
uh, interesting for Jessica's buff too, because there's, there was a bit of a discussion was this, um, we need to use the proper formats for computing because these data sets are big, so you want to parallelize a lot, but then maybe these data formats might not be the right ones for archiving, so there needs to be some uh, yeah, compromise to, to find a good way of doing this. And then we finished with uh, just opening up the question whether radio data providers would be interested to gather for a workshop, talk about how to best or, or find good ways of setting up nice and useful archives in a collaborative way. And um, yeah, and then there was also this brief mentioning of backwards compatibility and how some archives have to maintain legacy machines to go back to elderly data and make sure that they can still reprocess this data, work with this data. And yeah, that's that's something to keep in mind, something that might be difficult for, well, it's, it's a difficult question and definitely not solved yet. Although in the Discord chat, there is an ongoing discussion still how to use containers and singularity and so on to, to achieve this. So yeah, and yeah, one thing we also mentioned at the round table is that next week during the IVA, there's going to be a meeting of the radio interest group within the IVA. So everyone who's interested in these topics we discussed at the round table might also be interested in coming to this, um, to this session then. And I think this is all I, I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then we had uh, Bruce uh, with uh, a very interesting, well, all the boss were interesting, but this also was very interesting cost management on commercial cloud platform. So Bruce, if you are uh, here, you can just share your screen. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm ready. I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Here we go. Are you able to see my screen and hear me? Yep. Okay, great. All right, so, um, in this BOF, there were um, five presentations on cost management issues in various projects and organizations by Willow Mullane uh, from Rubin, Eric Mitchang from SkySilver, uh, Eva Moncheva from Space Telescope, and myself. I talked about uh, TESS and uh, cloud computing at IPAC. That was followed by 35 minutes of highly energetic and nuanced um, discussion. And the discussion was nuanced because it reflects the nuances of cost management, which is difficult to do. The costing on all providers is very fine grain. Uh, it can change underneath you uh, with no notice. And the services provided by uh, the big cloud providers nowadays can, can be overwhelming. The choice can be difficult to make. Uh, so I'm going to try and summarize as best I can this discussion. Uh, first of all, for navigating the complexities, there was a suggestion that maybe there could be some kind of cost management tools for the community to use, although it wasn't quite clear how that would be done. Um, there was a possibility of holding workshops at national conferences for non power users. I thought this might be a niche issue that we're talking about, but several people said no, they thought that would be good. Uh, so most of the people at ADAS do tend to be of the power user providers. Um, there was a discussion on the best practices. Um, particularly, you can do things like use on premise pilot studies to understand what resources you need. You can do your startup using the free tier or the small instances, which are very cheap and so on. You need to be really vigilant on how your costs are accruing because this is where you can get into trouble. Um, Eva's talk in particular gave a very useful list of all the things you need to be doing uh, when you're using the cloud and keeping your costs under control. Uh, you can negotiate, negotiate with cloud providers. Uh, that's no, generally easier, of course, if you're a large institution, but also ask for help. Uh, most of us who are giving the presentations had said that they found that uh, the help provided by cloud companies uh, is really very good. They really do try to be helpful. Uh, it was thought that the long-term solution to all these costing complexities is to actually have funding agencies negotiate rates uh, 
uh, borrowing for credits. Uh, I know that agencies in the US are actually starting this effort and hope it comes to um, fruition in the next year or two. Uh, finally, there was a discussion which was more technical than, than costing. It's about managing n-dimensional memory mapped files on cloud platforms, which is something that at the moment is very hard to do. Uh, does have an implication for costing, however. If it's hard to do, now you could very easily spend a lot of money trying to get that started up on a cloud platform. So that is my summary of the BOF. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bruce. All right. And the last, last right. we have uh, Francois. Uh, Francois, if you... Yes, yes. Uh, let it, let ah, me perfect. share my screen. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yes. So this buff was uh, Tuesday evening, the last one. So called uh, Practical Provenance in Astronomy. We started by an introduction to IVOA provenance made by Mathieu. Uh, the, the slides are available. Uh, we also had a, as a starting point, the answer to a questionnaire posted and filled by attendants and others before the session. We had a larger number of, um, of uh, answers. We also had a starting point, which was a two days very rich meeting uh, in the escape project in Europe in September, where we had a, a lot of uh, use cases presented. And uh, in the conference, we also had three posters on provenance, so one from CTA Dirac, one from Vizier and one from Opus, which is also related to CTA. So the discussion was, uh, I would say, not really lively, uh, despite a uh, strong interest in the questionnaire. So we were wondering uh, if uh, this was due to, to the late uh, uh, programming of this, of this, um, of this buff or if we had uh, too much information on the, on, the, on the introduction, maybe we don't know. So anyway, there was still a discussion. So about, for example, providing a specific way of providing minimal provenance, which would be the last step uh, producing the, the entities of the data sets we, have, we are interested in. Another point was a discussion about uh, serialization and, uh, and formats. So apparently there is strong interest in serialization in YAML and JSON. Viewtable also, but maybe a little less, and this will require some model mapping on top of Viewtable. There are proposals, as you can see in the zero um, poster, for example. But, um, we had uh, several points about the question of uh, provenance and reproducibility of the, of the data. Uh, for example, uh, one, uh, one discussed point was the translation of data flow language, which like CWL and data flow information into IVA provenance in reverse. Uh, people were interested in uh, knowing if we can uh, storing uh, software parameters values used for the activities into the activity representation, and the answer is yes. There was a proposal which uh, is rather new to use uh, code ID to identify software in the activity description. Uh, we also had a use case uh, explain where people are interested in finding out data set produced with a given version of software and the actually the, the IVOA provenance metadata allows to, to store this kind of information to find out uh, a, a associated data set to or entities to a given version of uh, software. And uh, we also discussed the point of visualization and uh, some VOPROV library 
uh, outputs were, were shown. Uh, they are also available in the posters. And uh, so the access using the protocols, so for example, ProfSAP and ProfSAP has been uh, uh, evocated and there will be a DM session, uh, a presentation on this and a discussion in the DM session during the uh, interop next week. So I think that's it. And uh, that's all for, for provenance both. Sorry, we were, we didn't understand, not, none of us understood that we had something to prepare for this evening. So that's okay. Excuse, you the, did a the, great bad, job. excuse the bad quality of the slide. <laughs> ah, it's fantastic. Don't worry.